Grant Stain. Join me as I do interviews with leaders in the field of artificial intelligence from across the world. We speak about the business relevance of artificial intelligence, and we also speak about the future. Is it to be feared or to be embraced? Please subscribe at my website for updates on future interviews. Hello, artificial intelligence enthusiasts. My guest today is Archie Aracol, who is a machine learning and data engineer. We touched on important topics during our conversation, such as how to get into a career working in artificial intelligence. We spoke on timely and controversial topics, such as facial recognition. And we also spoke about privacy ethics and the future of artificial intelligence. Welcome and enjoy listening to the talk. Archie, it's so good to see you. I'm gonna fire off this question immediately. I walk up to you at a cocktail party and the typical question, so what do you do? How do you answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> I always get that, so I don't know how to answer that question because, so immediately I would say, I'm a machine learning engineer. And then people will be like, okay, what is, what is that? <laughs> what yes. do you do? Do you build machines? Do you build robots? Nope, that's not what I do. What I'm, what I'm actually, what I actually am, is an AI enthusiast, someone that is trying to use AI responsibly and actually change technology with the way it's being done at the moment. Because I feel that AI is a buzzword, and we do need to use it sparingly and yes. use it where necessary. So that's essentially what I do in a quick, brief nutshell. <laughs> okay. It's, it's amazing. Like I am, the other day I had an interesting comment because also when I speak to people about artificial intelligence is they either have this Hollywood view of total destruction and um, mm. you know, robots taking over all that. But the other yeah. day for the first time somebody said, is that something to do with um, alien life? So, so, you know, so, and they asked me, do I work in one of these places where you've got the, the, the radar beams and you listen for signals from outer space? And I was floored. I didn't know how to answer. I said Obviously, yes. <laughs> you should have said I, yes. <laughs> and you should hear the things they're telling us. <laughs> they're already here. <laughs> they're already here. They're amongst us. <laughs> exactly. And I'm one of them. So, <laughs> so you can have a lot of fun with it, you know. Um, hmm. So I think, and, and we spoke a little bit about, we started the recording about, you know, I think there are two relevant views which we need to balance. The one is the optimistic view of the future of AI. Yeah. A lot of commercial benefit, a lot of potential uh, life, quality of life, things like that. And then there's the weaponization and the, the implants and potential um, Orwellian future, if you would. So um, yeah. where do you stand on that spectrum, do you think? So in terms of whether I believe AI is, should, is actually as good as, it, as people say it is, I think it can, uh, just like any technology, there's obviously a good side and there's a bad side to it. And we can't get away from it. That's where I stand. We can't get away from the fact that technology is progressing and things are being developed and invented every single day. As we speak, there's probably 10 inventions that are happening as we know. So uh, we can't get away from it. But what we can do is actually control the way we take it forward. We can always, we have the control to actually use these tools and these technologies to our, to our advantage in such a way that we don't actually destroy the human race. We have the power. We actually have a lot more power than we think we have. So it's not as scary as Terminator is going to come and take over the entire world. It's, it's actually very far from that. <laughs> so where I stand in that spectrum is I believe AI can be used and it can be used for the good. And I think it should be used. Um, it is the natural progression of technology, and we should actually get on that bandwagon as soon as possible if we want to use it in the right way. That's a good answer. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, if a, a high school or a college student or this, is listening to us now and they want to, well, as I say, get into AI, <laughs> mm. what would you give them uh, as advice? Where do they start? What must they do? Yeah. So AI is very broad. <laughs> um, getting into AI it's not as simple as you just do one course and that's it. Um, AI, once again, is a tool to solve a problem and it might not necessarily always be the tool to solve the problem. So if someone is trying to get into this industry, what the first thing I would say is don't specialize immediately. Um, you don't know whether AI is exactly what you need to solve the problem. And you know, the first, the first construct we have usually is remove all biases. 
So if you want to truly use AI to its full potential, remove all biases, try and get into an industry. So for example, my background is purely software engineering. I started off as a software engineer. I had to learn the bare bones of security, networking, um, actually basic software principles before I got to a point of understanding how I could use AI. Even in my day-to-day -day work as it stands currently, I don't always use AI. I don't always sit with data sets and sit there cleaning and try and find insights out of it. I don't sit and create new faces every day. Um, yes. That's just sometimes. Uh, but you do have to have your basics and foundations in place. So I would say start with a solid foundation. If you're looking to get into the engineering spectrum, do something in the, in the engineering spectrum or do something in the software spectrum, so a computer science degree or, or engineering degree, just to get that solid foundation and that problem solving ability, because that's actually where the true yes. key is. And for example, if you also want to get more into the data side of things, and if you want to actually start playing with data sets, get into the math side. Maths is also very, very important. Get yes. a degree in, in mathematics. So get those foundations solid first before you specialize in AI. So yeah, mm. that's my advice. Absolutely. Otherwise people just become, and I hope I don't offend anyone, but they become what I call <laughs> propeller heads. So, you know, I speak to, to business customers or when I speak at conferences and a lot of super technical people, because I am not super technical myself. I have to, I have to really learn fast and keep on learning about this technology, but it's understanding yeah. and you've alluded to it already is what problem is it going to solve? So it is fundamentally business conversation. I think it's fundamentally a people change conversation. I think mm -hmm. we jump into the deep end and start looking at Python and all kinds of things and algorithms and um, yeah. data sets and stuff. And it's not, it's about people and it's about how we use exactly. this technology, you know. Do you, when mm. you speak with, with customers or peers and, and you know, because the, the question I often get is, so like I said, if a young person say, I want to get into AI, business people also say that we want to get into AI. You know, the silver bullet that's going to change all our problems. Do you yeah. find that that happens a lot? Uh, that too, even too often. The, <laughs> too often. Even, even at senior business uh, leader level, that they are still confused about what this technology really yeah. is. Your experience. Yeah. No, I definitely have that experience more often than I wish I had. <laughs> so, um, the first, I always start off with a sentence saying, AI is not magic. It's definitely mm. not the solution. Actually, if you're to look at a, a full end to end AI, well, a, a product that's seen as AI it's usually only 10% of that product that incorporates machine learning or AI. The rest of it is actually the bare bones of data engineering, software engineering, security, networking. There's just so much. I mean, even the consumer, consumer side of things, like you need to have behavioral analysts maybe involved. You need business analysts involved. There's so many different areas that need to be collaborating with each other in order to get something to move forward. So usually when I do speak to people who say, we want AI or we want to use AI in a business, in our business. And how can I move forward is I first, I pop the bubble and then tell them that AI isn't everything. And then the second step would be to, okay, if AI isn't everything, but you'd like to use AI because there is, there is a potential chance here. How far along are you in your journey? Because it is a journey at the end of the day. It's not something, a wand that you could just easily whip and boom, it's all done. It's a journey that needs to be taken over time and only then can you actually utilize it to its full potential responsibly. <laughs> I have to always add that component in. <laughs> so yeah, so that's, it, it happens quite often, but it's as long as it, it's well, what I try to at least achieve is say that it is a journey and there is a bunch of processes that need to occur before you actually get to that end state. It is possible, it's, but it is a journey at the end of the day. Yeah, I agree with you. I often find if, if people say we want to use AI, where the conversation becomes uncomfortably quiet is if my response is to do what? <laughs> and you can see they're thinking because they haven't thought it through yet. You know, um, yeah. I think often there's a, some sort of a KPI or a mandate from the CIO or the CEO to say you have to put AI somewhere in the business. Yeah. And more often than not, I find that the AI is not actually the solution. It's, it's process reengineering or the data mm. is a mess or the people yeah. are not skilled enough, you know, so mm -hmm. really backtrack before you even look at, AI and you've, you've used the word journey and it's, it's beautiful that you say that because I think our job is, as people who work in this field is to help others mm. understand the journey and mm. then yes you can get there and yes I think all businesses should look at AI um, now or in the future but how to get there um, mm. earlier when we spoke about um, if you want a career in AI I read and I think it's Nick Bostrom who said the two kind of jobs that will be most in demand in the future is ethicists and philosophers 
not data engineers or people like yeah. that. So, because we're opening up a can of worms that from a philosophical and ethical point of view, we, we never had to, to think about. Which brings mm. me to my next question. You know, there's so much talk at the moment about facial recognition, racial mm. bias, agenda bias, all those things. I mean, it's a hot topic and it's a relevant topic. Um, mm. you, we see the IBM, Amazon, um, Microsoft have now had a, a self-imposed monitorium against facial recognition. Do you mm. work in that field as well? And, and you know, what is your view on what's happening? Yeah. So yes, I do work in that field where, so I've had to actually in this past, past few months, we've had to do a lot of things around facial recognition purely because of the state of our, our nature where everything is being done using um, cameras. So it's become more and more in, in use at the moment. So um, my, my stance on that is, yes, it is a problem. There is definitely biases and there's definitely ethical implications to it, but once again, practitioners like ourselves need to ensure that people who are going on this journey and who are actually taking this, taking this into a production environment, they do cater for it. It, should, it shouldn't be an afterthought. Um, I always, uh, always go to the example where like, when you're building a data engineering pipeline, data quality is an afterthought. And we need, to, we need to get away from that, that same approach, especially when it comes to AI, because ethics needs to be in front of everything. When we are building these solutions, we need to keep in, we need to be cognizant of there is an ethical implication to this. There are biases involved in this. And how do we get around that? That shouldn't be an afterthought. So yeah, in, especially with um, the clients that I interact with, I try to keep that in front of me <laughs> all the time, wherever I go. I'm not very popular because of that, but <laughs> it is what it is. Um, but um, it is, it is very important. And it is very important that we think about ethics. It is important that we, we use AI to help humans, um, mm. not the reverse. <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. And whether yeah. you're popular or not, obviously we want to be, but you have to do what's <laughs> right. You have to give them the right advice. I, I, you know, this is, if I think about my son's future and, and his children's future, this, we can't mess around with this, you know, it's mm. so important. Um, it's not about a feature we're creating, not working, and now we're under pressure to budget pressure and time pressure. This is, we are busy building something that can, make life so much better or fundamentally destroyed like i guess nuclear power i want yeah. to touch on your on your career a little bit you currently with synthesis so, mm. so tell us very briefly maybe about the company and, and some of the work that you're doing there mm. so currently yes yeah, so i'm working with synthesis we're actually one of the uh, financial yeah we've got an aws certification for financial providers so essentially we are a premium partner with aws for peer, well financial partners and there's a few others that are in the pipeline at the moment and we're predominantly in the aws space however our division or the division that i'm i'm a part of um, essentially deals with data uh, so data ai any of these emerging sort of technologies in the data space we basically deal with in our division but at the same time, because we've got such a strong suit within the cloud space, and since there's lots of people who have that capability within our, within our company, we actually leverage off our cloud partners, our cloud guys within our team to actually help us to build pipelines and to build infrastructure that is ethical and is actually, uh, can actually promote AI and emerging technology in the most secure manner. So yeah, that's basically what we do in a nutshell from a data division point of view. So our division is called intelligent data and we use that purely because we understand that AI is great and all, but we need our data and we need to modify our data in order to actually get to the next step. So we actually leverage off our cloud capability. We leverage off, we have our own digital team as well. So they do other software in software practices as well. We've also got quite a lot of a uh, lot of uh, products within the regulatory space. So there's guys that have been cleaning addresses and cleaning data for years now within the SaaS mm -hmm. space. So we leverage off all these different capabilities. So by the end of the day, when it comes down to us, we know who we can go to, and we know how we can actually take this to the next step. That's okay. what we do. I'm glad to hear that in the same breath as talking about AI and cloud, you talk about um, or alluding to privacy, which mm -hmm. uh, apart from, I think, ethics is another massive issue. Um, mm. In South Africa, it seems that the, finally the PR Act will now really be enforced, you know, protection of personal information. We put the mm. GDPR in, in, in the, the EU. Um, yeah. And again, it's not something that we can play around with. The, the, 
the amount of damage that this kind of technology can do if our privacy is not protected. Mm -hmm. Next, I want to ask you, you also involved or were involved with the IEEE. Tell us a bit about that. Yes. So actually, I was involved with IEEE like six years ago, probably. So for people who don't, who don't know what that is? It's, um, it's the Institute of engineers i forget the other two e's okay. <laughs> but essentially it's a it's a group of us that um and it's quite a international internationally acclaimed um institute where a bunch of us engineers actually come together and we actually are certified engineers and we've actually come together to build a community that we could actually use to build and push um push different technology different solutions forward um, and research as well at the same time. So my involvement with IEEE was, um, once again, AI, because <laughs> AI is my thing. So essentially what I, what I did was I actually built a small unit within my university under the IEEE wing to actually research around AI, future potential AI projects. We came up with a bunch of facial recognition techniques. We came up with a bunch of computer vision techniques. Um, everything was in the research space, but what it came down to is a lot of us were enthusiasts who wanted to get into the space and we wanted to research this extensively. So mm. I truly gave us that platform where we could actually start leveraging all of the technologies that we could, we, we would need in future. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. The next thing is, is a bit about uh, minorities, uh, gender equality in, in our space. There are organizations mm -hmm. like women in big data, women in AI, and many, many others, and they're doing amazing work. Are you at all involved in any of those kind of uh, initiatives? Yeah. So I am involved in women in AI and women in engineering. Women in big data, I'm just following on LinkedIn. <laughs> but um, yeah, so women in AI and women in engineering, definitely those two. So I actually started off with women in engineering because in Tux, um, University of Victoria, we actually have quite a strong following there with women in engineering. There's a few of my friends that are on that panel as well. So um, I was quite heavily involved in their space. Um, also women in AI as well. Uh, quite quite a lot of uh, opportunities we get in that front. There's obviously a lot of conferences that we, can get, we get to attend to. There's a larger community we actually get to collaborate with, yes. which is what I think is great about these sort of um, Groups. Okay, so it's not just in South Africa that we get a chance to collaborate. We get to collaborate with a larger, um, a larger audience. So we get an international community that we get to do a knowledge sharing platform with, which is so key, especially in a in a field like AI and actually even in engineering or any space, having that open collaboration between people in different countries helps you to sort of diversify your knowledge as well. Uh, we get to see what's happening outside. We, they get to see what's happening inside and we can actually cross pollinate uh, opportunities and information as well. So yeah, so that's why I, I'm part of these organizations. <laughs> That's amazing. Look, I think it's, it's, it's a great networking opportunity, but I, you know, it, we, all, we need to look at this technology and I guess life for that matter through different lenses. And by mm -hmm. interacting with other people, we get different views because we will always, as much as we try and do stuff with fixed bias, we will never get free from our own bias. Yeah. I think. So <laughs> it's, it's hearing different views and, and seeing this tech, especially when, for me, when we speak about the ethics of the future and all that, it's to hear different people's different views, different experiences and all that. So mm -hmm. now I want to ask you about the future. I'm always careful with this question. My, there's two things I always say kind of tongue in cheek. One is I've got this, I've decided only to worry about what I can control. So there is almost nothing I'm worried about. Okay. <laughs> and then the other thing is um, if people ask me, what's your five-year plan? I say not to die. <laughs> it doesn't mean I don't have plans and ambitions and stuff. Um, so it's sometimes a bit of a, a, a funny question, but if, if, I would ask you, what, what do you want to do in five or 10 years from now? Mm. So I have a very funny view on that. I, I tend not to plan into the future <laughs> purely because it's, it comes down to, so I have, I have this natural inclination towards anxiety the minute that I start making plans into the future. Mm. Okay. So the fact that I can have, I have control over my exact moment right now, actually, those are the, those are the moments I actually try to make the best. So, for example, if I know that in five years, if I start planning in five years that I want to, I don't know, be a CTO of a company, that actually gives me anxiety because now I'm aiming towards that. And I will miss everything that I see in all the opportunities and all the things that I could potentially uh, make a difference in, in right in front of me. So what I aim to do at least is to try and 
uh, make a difference where I can, um, use my skills to make that difference and actually m- make an impact wherever I go. So those are, the, those are the factors that I look at. And if I can use technology to do that even better. So I'm aiming to use technology and use my skill sets because I believe that I've been given these skills and I have uh, been given an education so that I can actually make an impact mm-hmm. to the community. If we don't actually make an impact to our community, then for me personally, it feels like I'm not doing anything with my talents. So that's what I aim to do. Um, so I don't really look at what I want to be in the future. It's more a case of this is what I can control. And this is what I, this is my motto that I follow every day. I love that philosophy, that way of thinking about it, and I, I identify with it. Um, I agree with you. If, if we can't, it can't just be commercial. It can't just be about making millions or making someone else millions. Mm. We have to do good. It's a business for a purpose uh, kind of conversation. And, and I uh, mm. absolutely has the potential to, it's already doing good if we think about medicine and, and other areas, but if we think mm. about the future, if we do this right, like you said in the beginning, can do mm. so much good. So Archie, what kind of books have you been reading on this topic or books that you've read that you can recommend? Oof, there's way too many books actually <laughs> at this point. I've even hit like a, a blank at the moment, but um, something that I do look at and it's, I think something that helps me to sort of see the ethical component of AI is philosophical books. And I can't remember all the books that I've been reading, but um, funny enough, actually getting into philosophy, philosophy has helped me to see a different side to technology. So even if you are a technological enthusiast and you like AI, don't forget about the human element. So I think my recommendation would most likely be to keep, keep, keep tabs with the philosophical side and the, the people side of things, because that is actually what helps you, helps your AI to become human at the end of the day, um, helps you to give that human touch and helps AI to help you. So yeah, that's... I like that. I love that. As I said, ethics and philosophy, you know, we have to mix that into the AI conversation. Yeah. <laughs> conferences wise, uh, have you been speaking at conferences or webinars, uh, conferences that you like to attend that you could recommend or talk about? Mm. So I haven't spoken. I, they are a few lined up at the moment. I'm not sure yet with everything that has happened. Mm. Uh, but uh, so they are a few that I'd, I, I'd recommend. Maybe mostly the since I love the whole research element of things, the deep learning in DARPA, I think that's that's great. Actually, it's it's one of the one of the arenas that helps help me to push my AI uh, thinking forward, because it's a bunch of academics actually that come together and speak about AI and speak about the different side of things that we don't get to see in the industry. So I think if you are in the industry and you want to get into AI at some point, definitely go to one of the deep learning endowments. You get to see that academic side of things. And on the flip side, um, you get the AI Expo, which is very much on the other side of things, looking at the product space, how can we actually commercialize this? So having a balance between the two, I think would be great. Some, one of the conferences I haven't gone to as yet, and I'd like to in the future is Datacon which is essentially, um, it's purely about data, how to, what sort of products are out there to actually facilitate data engineering, which is actually very important as part of the AI life cycle. So yeah, that's, that's something I'd like to go to in the future. But apart from that, I think conferences as a whole is just great. Um, we get to see a whole arena of technology that we've never been, we, wouldn't, we probably wouldn't be able to see in the industry if, as, as we're working through it. So conferences, I think any kind of technological conference you can go to, grab that opportunity. And it's so much easier and cheaper, if not free. In fact, mm. like most or many people I speak to, I'm inundated with web- webinar invites. Mm. And I want to attend them all, but, you know, it all takes time. Like, time, It's no yeah. longer the travel and, you know, have to take a week's worth of leave or whatever. You mentioned AI Expo. I spoke with Nick Bradshaw, the organizer of the event a few days ago on, on this uh, webinar. Mm. And uh, they're going to do some amazing things with the platform mm. where it's still, it's almost like you're there. You can go to different exhibitors. Yeah. And so it's amazing what you can do, you know, and you're in the convenience mm. of your own home. So that's good. Exactly. Archie, I think I'd love to have a chat to you again in a few weeks as time permits. I think there's topics we spoke about today that I'd like to zone in on. I think yeah. especially on the ethics side, the, the, the gender minority side, potentially. Um, uh, I did a, some work with a, a girls in AI a few weeks back, which is doing amazing work. And um, I met 
some uh, we had girls from from a, like a privileged kind of a school here in Johannesburg, and then girls from an other privileged area brought mm. them together, and they were divided in different groups, different mentors. And I was a, a mentor of one of the groups, mm. and and these girls from from both kind of if you would the good and the poor school, and they were I reckon 13, 14 years old. I was amazed at how smart they were, how informed they were. Um, and, and, and especially some of the girls who, you know, they don't have internet, television, uh, most likely can barely attend school. It's mm. so sharp. And, and that's something I'm feeling very passionate about. We've, we've got people like that who will end up doing a, a manual kind of work job one day. And again, every kind of job is honorable, but it's just a waste if that kind of potential Mm. and not be um, leveraged and, and we help people so that's also mm. a topic i think to unpack a bit more yeah. when we speak i've actually this. got a couple of side project projects on that as well so there's a few mm. things we could talk about i'd love that archie thank you for your time i wish you the best and i look Pleasure. forward to speak soon again thank you so much okay <laughs>